Thank you everyone for joining. Um, so I don't know some of you, my name's Tom, I'm uh, help lead GV in Europe, Google Ventures, and it's my privilege to be able to introduce today's speakers who you can see uh, on the slide uh, on the panel. But it's, look, this is an incredibly important conversation. Uh, apologies for the occasional ping, that will be people uh, joining. But as you know, the focus today is gonna to be on global equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, since George Floyd's heartbreaking murder in late May and the you know, outpouring of protests in solidarity and anger, actually in divisiveness as well that have followed, we wanted to address how companies are managing belonging and equity in the workplace and not just do that for the US, but importantly to think that through globally and particularly in Europe as well. Candice is going to be joined by Jonathan Ashong Lamptey. So Jonathan's a speaker, a broadcaster and describes himself as an inclusion protagonist. Now, I've known Jonathan for over 25 years, and so I can say hand on heart for that uh, period that we've been friends that this is authentically important to Jonathan. This is something that Jonathan's been thinking about for decades. He's someone that I've learned from for that whole period, and actually uh, he's someone that I continue to learn from. And on that subject, I think mean, I should stop talking and hand over to the the people that actually know about this and are keen to get your input as well. So without further ado, I'd love to hand it across to Candice and I will maybe wrap up at the end, just primarily thank you both for taking the time, but over to you both, thank you again. Thank you, Tom, thank you for the warm uh, welcome. And I am so excited to get into today's discussion with Jonathan. I've been doing this work for about 15 years uh, and I've primarily been based uh, across Wall Street, across Silicon Valley. I spent some time in Switzerland. I have a lot of clients based in the UK. And the cross-cultural aspect of today's conversation is incredibly exciting to me. Jonathan, I'm going to start with some very lighthearted topics for you. <laughs> uh, as Tom set up, it's been... It's been quite a journey this year. Uh, not only do we have the backdrop of a global pandemic, uh, but we've also got really coming from the spring, late May into June, this disturbing image that, that started to circulate around the world. I remember coming back from Memorial Day weekend in, in the States and, uh, and then the first image I saw when I came back to work was this, this video still of, of this man with this knee upon his neck. Um, and of course, we know that that was George Floyd. Since then, we've had a series of, of situations such as, uh, you know, Breonna Taylor's uh, murder and essentially um, acquittal of, of all involved. These, you know, in, in a sense, these extrajudicial deaths of a number of people. And the response has been incredibly global. So we've seen protests around the world. And it's not that these issues started or anything new. So, you know, we saw some people say, well, you're finally paying attention. Thank you. Um, and we saw others and companies struggle to kind of respond. I want to start with the, the zeitgeist of what's been happening in 2020. Um, and so essentially, I want to ask you, what, what is happening right now in terms of inequity and race? And, and how has this started to enter the workplace? Sure. A light question. As you exactly. Said. I promise. Well, first off, Candice, I want to say thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for making space for me to share some of my thoughts and opinions on this topic. It would be useful if we take a little step back in 2020. As you said, it's been a, a dramatic year. So if you remember, probably around March, April, just after the pandemic, we were starting to experience lockdown, most of us. Um, what we saw was diversity and inclusion as a narrative really fall off. It really, no one was really talking about it. And if they were, it was lots of, you know, Forbes articles or Harvard Business Review articles, people fighting to say that diversity and inclusion is still relevant. It's important. And one of the reasons why I think it fell off being important was because a lot of organizations realized that their diversity, inclusion, and however we describe these things, um, 
they they didn't really have leaders they had events managers they had people who were running events in their organizations can't have any events we don't really have anything to say around diversity and inclusion so that happens then then as you described everything that happened with george floyd it brought this concept into everyone's mainstream consciousness so and it's worth pointing out these were things as you said that were happening anyway these are issues that are mm -hmm. ongoing nothing to, to a large extent nothing new happened but was the real focus was it was now in everyone's line of sight people their attention was on their screens everyone was paying attention to this issue and they had nothing else to do or say and so for me this this is one of the reasons why it became a mainstream problem racism is typically something that we're taught not to talk about right racism right. religion class don't talk about these things now everyone was talking about them and so what does that mean and so as we saw we saw these black squares right people showing solidarity but the challenge was it we, this, it was going to move from being a new story and it was going to it's going to just carry on so what what does that mean organizations now raised this mm -hmm. as an issue it now became an organizational issue and why is that is because people were asked well what do you think about this should we be saying something about this and that became a real challenge and i think and this is really important for everyone listening as well a lot of commitments were raised as part of that so typically there were three things that organizations said right so number one they said racism and and we can talk a little bit later about what is or isn't racism Let's. but racism is something that's abhorrent it's got no place in our society no place in our organization so that was one thing calling out racism Anywhere we see it, we're going to call it out. That was one thing. The second thing, and you may have seen this, was to throw money at the situation. So we are now going to donate. We are now going to support organizations, institutions, causes that support the black community or anti-racism, issues like that. We are going to show our support. And then the third thing was this commitment to anti-racism. Now, this is a word that frankly, and I've worked in this space for a while, you know, I did a PhD a few years ago, but I've been doing this stuff over 10 years. I haven't heard people in everyday life talking about anti-racism until this mm -hmm. year. So now organizations who haven't been talking about it are now talking about anti-racism. But what they don't realize is anti-racism comes with very strong commitments, very strong commitments. It's not enough to do nothing. You have to be doing something. So anti-racism is a very binary view, and it mm -hmm. implies that proactive action is going to be taken so this is a huge challenge and this is where we are in terms of organizations this is what's motivating this conversation now yeah i you know i agree completely with what you said and particularly that moment from spring uh for kind of late winter going into early spring in march uh having many many friends and practitioners that do this work and consultancies uh as the pandemic set in, they started to lose business. They had rifts. They uh, they were having trouble getting the attention of organizations. And then there was kind of this whiplash um, in May uh, as as the conversation on anti racism uh, began to take place. And you know, even at GV, we had these very frank discussions around systemic racism and anti racism and what that really means. And in my fifteen years. I had not had such open conversations, as you say, on anti-racism and the work that that requires. Um, I want to go back to something you said around uh, diversity leaders as event managers. Controversial statement, Jonathan. Uh, what, do you feel that the ro role of diversity leaders has shifted in any way given March to May? I would say the perception has shifted as opposed to the role. So what, what's the true role of, of and actually, do you know, let's maybe we should get clear on some terms as well. When we're talking about diversity, so we've got equity, equality, diversity, inclusion, belonging, all of these words are thrown around, used and abused, and it's often unclear what they mean. So when, when I think of diversity, I think of diversity as a management approach that recognizes that as individuals, we all have differences. So we all have differences. And if we support diversity, it means that we recognize those differences and we think that there is value in those differences. Mm -hmm. So that's what diversity as a management approach means. Inclusion 
is something different. So inclusion, once again, it's a business, a systematic business strategy that says that everyone should be able to share the same advantages. Everyone should be able to share the same benefits. Everyone should be able to belong. And the way I describe it is everyone can perform and everyone can belong. So everyone can reach their potential. So there is a subtle difference because Correct. the way diversity and inclusion is, is thrown around, especially at conferences, at talks like this, I can get very emotive. I can you know, use loads of catchphrases. Everyone gets excited. But what it doesn't do is help anyone here to manage that issue next week or the week after. So it's really important to understand that. So getting back to your question, a leader should be trying to promote inclusion. And they're going to manage diversity. And that's going to look different in every single organization. And so I think the perception was, as we said, so this crisis has happened. A lot of organizations looked around and said, OK, look, we need to make a statement. What should we do? And they realized perhaps that the person who was there in place didn't know what to do or didn't know what to say because they were focused on things like community, employee resource groups, networks. We're going we're gonna to celebrate Black History Month. In the UK, for those of you who don't know, it's Black History Month. You're, you're seeing mm -hmm. and hearing a lot of people using words like celebrate. They're getting their Black employees to say, what does it mean to them? Now, that's, that's important and it's part of it. It's part of the community building, but there should be a lot more. The other thing is a, a compliance approach. You're going to hear people talking about a talent pipeline. We need to develop a talent pipeline. And it's a very HR-driven approach, mm -hmm. recruitment, retention, promotion. These are the things we need to do. Um, but what there's not enough e emphasis on, and this is the issue, Candice, is character and competence. What is the competence of the people who are doing this work? What competencies are they encouraging in others? What are the character? What's the purpose of your organization? What does that mean for the character of the individuals who are leading it and the mm -hmm. individual who you want to be driving this within the organization? It's right. not talked about enough. That's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. And I I, I would say uh, to that effect, as as you know, as Tom mentioned, I, I led diversity and inclusion at Pinterest for four years. Uh, and uh, as the company scaled, and it's interesting because even over that time, there was this evolution of the role doing it for that amount of time in a high growth startup where you do start with this emphasis on diversity and recruiting and hiring and you move into uh, inclusion. But a lot of times those inclusion, the inclusion initiatives focus on, as you say, employee resource groups and belonging for discrete groups, less so focused on what it means to be an inclusive manager and what that means for leadership, what that means for your executives, the behaviors that they need to exhibit. And then even less so does it focus on the product or the business or the clients or the consumers. Uh, and so I would say at GV, one of the things that we saw with our portfolio, we had a, we had a few conversations, was people were at that point where they were stuck. They, they, had, they had a recruiting process. They wanted to ramp that up. They wanted more diversity in recruiting. They had ERGs, but they didn't quite know what to do next. So I, I guess I, what I want to ask you is, you're right. We saw the black squares. We saw the statements. Uh, these conversations internally are really hard. You started by defining some of these words. How does, you know, if I'm listening, if I'm on the call, how do you talk about this internally? How do you make it safe? I think, I think you, need, you need a shared language. You need to shared reference points. Um, and, and also, you need to agree on what, what you're trying to achieve. So the central problem that everyone is facing when they're talking about diversity, inclusion, belonging, the central problem is what we call the three Ps, people, potential, performance. So the first P is people. You're trying to engage people who are either underrepresented. You need to make sure that it's an inclusive environment where everyone can perform, right? So you need, that also means, by the way, it's not just about minority groups. It's not just about underrepresented groups. It's right. the people who are part of the majority. So inclusion is for everyone. So some of the narrative that you've heard is whenever you hear about diversity, you've got someone who appears to be from a minority group or is underrepresented or is disadvantaged. And often the narrative is, well, that excludes me if you're not one of those people. That, that is a false narrative. That's something that needs to be addressed. It needs to. Everyone needs to feel that they can understand and contribute to that to to what it means inclusion so that's, so that's the first thing the second thing is potential creating a culture of inclusion where everyone can reach their potential 
So mm -hmm. your question was, where do you start? You need to cultivate this culture over time. And mm -hmm. a large part of that is socializing people, just socializing language. So if we're talking about race, and we'll, we'll talk about race and racism, because these are words that are just thrown around. And in the past yeah. three months, it means something, a lot of people here, it means something completely different. Like mm -hmm. some, I know some of you have just woken up in the morning, right? You've just woken up, maybe you're in the West Coast of the US, and depending on what you read, you're being told you've just woken up, you haven't spoken to anyone, and now you're a racist, but you don't understand why, or how is that even possible? And you're actually you're part of this system of racism. These are some of the narratives that don't get explained. Or right. and and this is the thing: I'm not trying to convince anyone that racism does or does ex doesn't exist. Right. What I want you to do is understand that other people believe it. Other people conceptualize it in a particular way. It's just useful to understand what those perceptions are. And when you can have that conversation, that language, that's when it becomes useful. And then the first thing, I, I, I've got to tell yeah. you one, this is the one that I think it would be, be of most interest to everyone here, is this so-called business case for diversity. So it's about performance. The research does show that there's a business case for diversity, but it's not consistent in all firms, in all contexts, at all times. So you need to find your own business case. So right. simply increasing diversity is not going to make it work for you. So yeah. another inconvenient question I ask Candice <laughs> is, Thanks. what does diversity look like in your organization? Why is, it a, why is it good for you? You've heard that what the research says, but why is it good for you in your team? That is one of the central questions that you should be asking yourself. So if you address those three things, that's what the DNI, the CDO, Chief Diversity Officer should be doing, but they're not doing it alone. They need to be, bring everyone along on that journey. Right. Yeah. And I would argue or I would agree and also say they, the the business needs to bring everyone along on that journey. And this and the chief diversity officer is almost like the PM of of this work that, you know, I, I would say one other, you know, kind of element that I, I think changed because everything that you mentioned is evergreen. You should that this should always be the work of diversity, um, whether it's that in, it's not just that individual. Right. It's with the leadership team. But the, the conversations that people were struggling to have, the fear of saying the wrong thing, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people were, were frightened to engage in this conversation. And, and suddenly, CEOs and leaders were asked to stand in front of the entire company and say, you know, say words about anti-racism, as you said. Uh, I think that made some of these conversations difficult for people to have. And, and then also, I want to bring in the point that you made right around not convincing people whether racism exists or not. Um, you know, when I typically lead a session on unconscious bias or racism training, uh, what I do tell people, because I'm highly aware of the fact that, you know, as a black woman, I'm talking about racism and there are these dynamics in the room, right, that you need to kind of disarm a little bit. Um, and I say, you know, I'm going to present some facts and I'm going to present some outcomes. And uh, I'm not going to try to get a concept in your head or change your mind. Uh, I'm going to tell you why this is important for our culture as a business, but you're free to decide. Uh, so I, I think that the yeah. navigating the conversations around this topic that people didn't have the vocabulary for became very fraught. Um, are, is there ways that you would advise, advise to disarm people a little bit and, and help them feel comfortable having these conversations they were suddenly responsible for in front of hundreds or thousands of people. It's that idea of the responsibility as well that is so daunting, isn't it? Because people are there and like you said, you now have to be an expert and you don't have to be an expert on race, but you do need to have a critical mass of knowledge. And so what I do when I'm talking about this, and you see this as well in the research, no one actually says what race is and to a large extent, it doesn't matter as much as focusing on the meanings attached to it. So we, everyone here, we, if I asked everyone, what does race mean? What do you think? We're all going to come up with different answers, right? Even the academics, they can't come up with a consistent answer. That's fine. But what we can agree is that there are meanings attached to race and that whether we right. experience it or not, other people have outcomes that are related to their race, or at least they perceive that that is the case. 
And that's what is really important to do. And so I like using a shared reference point, even a book, because we need to, so I typically pick a book, like a, whether it's white fragility, it doesn't really matter, but any book and understand the meanings attached to race within that. You could, it could be a podcast, it could be an article, anything, something that we can all read this and say, okay, this is what my perception of the challenges or the issues are. And then speaking to what you said as well, Candice, let's look at some of the data. What does the data say according to what we're reading? So mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is really build this critical mass of knowledge and understanding what perceptions are around race and racism. So mm -hmm. never get into an argument about someone about, oh, that's not the right definition of race. Like, that's not right. very useful. That's not right. very, and you can get into trolling. And also, I, I want to put my hands up as well. And I, I've discussed this with Candice before. I've got plot armor. Right. And when I say that, and it's funny because Tom, I describe myself as an inclusion protagonist. Right. And in a protagonist in a movie, you can't die. Right. If, if it's my movie, I can't die. I can't get hurt. So when I'm talking about race and racism, frankly, I've got benefits and privileges. I'm not going to. I could use the N word and it would be quite different compared to if anybody else used the N word in this environment. It'd be I think mm -hmm. we'd all agree it'd be inappropriate anyway. But somehow mm -hmm. I would be able to get away with it compared to other people because I'm black, because I've studied this, because I've got a PhD, I work with organizations in this mm -hmm. space. So it gives me particular privileges. And as I say, plot armor. So you have to remember, sometimes when you are speaking with people, they've got plot armor that you don't. And it's important to understand that context and understand that privilege. Mm -hmm. And I also want to draw attention to the fact that I'm referring to my own privilege here. Typically, in the past three months, if you've heard anyone talking about privilege, they've been talking about white privilege. And mm -hmm. it's a shortcut, right? So people say privilege, they mean white privilege. And then, of course, they drop the mic and don't explain what that even means. And you're right. expected to understand that. And so having this shared reference, whether it's a book, a podcast or something, allows everyone to get a shared meaning and understanding of some of these key terms. Really quick, two things you said. Um, you talked about how people perceive their experiences of belonging. And, you know, I could imagine some people listening and saying, but wait, no, <laughs> there are these differential outcomes and and they're not just in people's heads. Um, I I, I want to hear what, you know, your take on this, uh, because, you know, for example, one of the things I shared with uh, the GB team is, you know, we got together this 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 Monday after the protest started and uh, and we, you know, we kind of set up a space and we process, but we also spent a little bit of time talking about what in, at least in the US context, we mean by systemic racism. And, and this includes things like the wealth gap, right? The fact that the median income of, of white Americans is 10 times higher than the median income of black Americans. And that is tied to, uh, you know, the history of slavery, illegal, you know, it was illegal to have any ownership or get an education. We also talk about present day things. Obviously the wealth gap is one present day thing, but like uh, criminality, uh, the fact that uh, minority youths are 18 times more likely to be tried as an adult, right? So there, there are these outcomes and there are these perceptions. And, and you mentioned in some ways, the perceptions alone still matter. Um, one thing that comes to mind for me is uh, when I was at Pinterest, we we would uh, when we'd ask people about belonging and what it meant to them, it had nothing to do with being uh, belonging to a particular group. Sometimes, a lot of times, it had to be, well, I'm on an engineering team that that isn't as valued, and I feel like my belonging is, you know, I don't feel like I belong as much because does this team really belong? Is it making a difference? However, someone perceived it, it was having an impact on their morale, their engagement, and their ability to produce. So let me let me just I'm going to ask you a little bit about that that perception versus outcomes and 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 I ask you to elaborate a little bit more and then I want to throw in the cultural context because we're just we're talking about words but obviously across the U.S. and the U.K. and then even multinationally these words and this context is even is different. So what are your thoughts on? Absolutely. And so do you know what I can use that uh, I talk about the ethnic penalty a lot. I can use that as a way to to manage manage this so you do need to look at both the perceptions are important but the research shows you know in different contexts 
outcomes are different. So ethnic penalty is a great example that is rooted in the workplace. So as you said about median incomes, ethnic penalty shows, and this is based in the UK from the Office of National Statistics over labor force survey over 40 years. And what it shows is that um, there is a hierarchy in terms of the average earnings, and they take into account age, location, skills, education, all of this stuff, there's, there's an unidentified differential. There's something unidentified that they can't explain, but it corresponds with ethnicity. And what you find is that the people at the top of this pyramid, and actually you might expect them to be white British, but actually they're not. I think they're um, white Antipodeans, so white Australians, white um, New Zealanders, uh, people who are Chinese as well. At the very bottom are people who are black African, black Caribbean, uh, Bangladeshi. And this is a hierarchy. And so you can see outcomes, and this is regardless of the industry, this is what it looks like. So there are specific outcomes there that matter, and they need to be explained, once again, in the context of your organization. So if you look at what this looks like within your organization, you are going to see, maybe not your organization, but many, you're going to see differentials in outcomes. Why? What does that tell us? That is where you're pointed to. That's where you need to start doing your work to understand how to create change. So that's one thing. The other thing as well about, yes, there are differences in the way we talk about these things. You'll notice that I was talking about ethnicity. In the UK, we don't talk about race that much. We talk about ethnicity. We use a term called BAME, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic. And typically, it's mean, it means people who are non-white. But can you see it conflates? And even if I say Black, that's, which is a racial term, Asian, which is an ethnic term, minority ethnic, that which is an ethnic term. So it, it starts to conflate things. And so it's, it's increasingly falling out of favor. Whereas, you know, in the US, you've got people of color, and now people are saying BIPOC mm -hmm. as well, yeah. to uh, people who are indigenous as well. So these terms grow. And, and I can understand how intimidating that is when there's another word, there's another phrase, there's something else that I need to understand. The more that happens, the more it tells you, the more shocking it is, the, the more it tells you how far away you are from the narrative. And so the example I always bring up, it's like having a kid who brings a slang word into the home, right? Mm -hmm. They've been in the playground, they've learned a new word from their friends. You are not in the playground with their friends, you're not part of that community. But by virtue of having contact with your child, you are now learning new things. And it's a similar thing when you hear this narrative and these words that you don't understand, it's often a signal of your distance to the people who are actually living in that community and using some of that language. Right. So, yeah, but there's loads of differences. Even the other thing is in France as well, measuring right. ethnicity, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It, there's laws to say that it can't happen. In the UK, we're pushing that. Yeah, it's um, when I, so a couple of years ago, um, the, uh, the, the U.S. Embassy in Berlin asked me to come to Germany and I, I, I did a tour and, uh, you know, I was talking about inclusion and ethnicity and, um, and the term race, right, uh, was just so fraught. It, you just don't use it. There is, there is a, you know, a cultural weight to that term. Um, that is that is inaccurate. And it's interesting because we're talking about people being, you know, afraid to say the wrong thing and, and tongue tied. You still have to have a conversation, but you need to understand the cultural context. Also, to your point, different laws around what source of data you could even collect um, and, and the philosophy, uh, you know, particularly when I was working with French clients around even the ideas of employee resource groups being inherently divisive, not having this hyphenated identity that in the U.S. is actually very common, uh, right? Um, and that being considered more divisive um, instead of, you know, a source for people to to belong and collaborate to, um, amongst people who share their identity. Um, and then, you know, I, I another important difference that I remember from that trip is uh, discussions of refugees and uh, in the workforce, you know, recent migrants, right? Those with a migration background. And that was something that some companies were starting to measure and track as opposed to, to other uh, categories. And that's a sensitive topic here, right? With Brexit, which remember when that felt like a big deal? Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I will advocate commenting, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we've got our own perceptions and uh, strong feelings about that here, which, you know, half the country share, half the country don't. And so it goes to that point about division as well. But yeah, it's, it's really important to understand the cultural context in doing this. You shouldn't just try and copy and paste what you're doing in one region compared to another. It's, right. it's very important to be specific. 